Hello and welcome to the Sound on Sound People and Music Industry podcast with me, Sam Ingalls. I'm very, very happy to be joined today by C. Mac Nagayan and Andy Bensley of Genelec. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you very much. Hey, Sam. Thank you for having us. It's an absolute pleasure. I thought maybe we could start by talking a little bit about company history because Genelec's first loudspeaker, as I understand it, was the S30, which was produced in 1978 for the Finnish National Broadcaster. We're all quite used now to the idea of active loudspeakers, but in 1978, that must have been quite an unusual product to start a company with. Yes, you are right. During that time, active technology was not so popular, and that was the start of Genelec history and, and the whole story. And that has been a big shift also in the professional audio monitoring that started from that time. As you said, it was a joint project that was established together with a Finnish public broadcast. And the idea was that they wanted to build the new facilities. And for that, they were asking for monitor loudspeakers and they, they were talking about uh, what kind of technology they, they wanted to use. And uh, during that time, Ilbo Martikainen and Topi Partanen, they were studying in Helsinki University of Technology. And it's, it's very interesting because during that time also, it was very typical for broadcasters that they had their own research organization and there was there was a person from that organization who was studying also in the same university and he had asked Ilpo and Topi if they could make such a product. That was the beginning of very fascinating history. And uh, after they published the product, after they made the product, uh, the actual project started two years before the company was founded. So it, it took for a while to develop the product. But after they demonstrate the products to the Finnish broadcasters and, and people there, they were very fascinated because of the audio quality. And after that, they also introduced the product in different shows. And, uh, you know, that was the beginning of active technology in a wider mean in the in the whole industry and after now more than 40 years if you now look at the industry especially in the professional audio very very rarely you can see any other products than active technologies absolutely and whereas many loudspeaker manufacturers are primarily hi-fi companies focused on the hi-fi market Genelec have always kept that focus on professional audio. How is that reflected in your design ethos? Well, I think that is very essential for, I would say that for the DNA of the company from the beginning, that has been the focus point for whatever we have been doing. And I think is probably one of the most important thing is that when you are working with the professional audio, then from the beginning, they had to take into account the requirements that come from there. I have said many times that the fact that we have highly reliable products that, you know, last for a long time, it was actually a demand from our customers. And I think that has been very, very essential part of whatever we have done, the the foundation for the uh, philosophy of the company that uh, started from the demand that professional users they, they had been asking for. So for that, in a sense, it has been invisible, but very essential foundation for for whatever we have been doing as still. That is the core focus that we have. So do you think it would be appropriate to describe Genelec as an engineering-led company in that sense? Well, I think uh, it could be said like that. Maybe we have to also look at, from the user point of view, I I think it's a very nice crossroad here that between high technology and and people who really do the sound, the art. So it's a a combination of different things here. But I would look at uh, technology as the foundation to to enable uh, users to do what they want to do. Yes, the starting point is, of course, having a good technological foundation there, and everything starts from that. 
There are a lot of loudspeaker companies in the world now, but quite a few of them don't actually develop their own drivers. They use off-the-shelf components and they put those together to make a loudspeaker. However, as I understand it, Genelec design and produce everything in-house, every part of their speakers. Does that give you an advantage? Well, I think uh, Genelec as a company, and because of uh, what you what you already said, that the technology from the beginning was the starting point for, for everything. It, it has been a very heavily R&D driven company. And because of that, we have done, in many areas, we have done inside the company, we have been developed in different areas, including the driver technology. But at the same time, we have been also using drivers from, from different suppliers, but in cooperation during the R&D R&D phase. So we have been designing together, we have been uh, working together. And uh, for those, I would say that for some product models that were more like closer to standard area, we have been also using external drivers. But for those key areas, like, for example, if you look at uh, middle frequency in that area, we have been doing our drivers from the beginning, from S30 up to now that we have de- we have done everything inside the house, and also with some key products, flagship products like the ones, we do everything inside the house. Uh, that has been a kind of strategic choice that we have done. Is not actually limited to drivers. Maybe drivers have a very special position in a uh, lot of speaker manufacturing and also in our industry. But uh, uh, for example, we do our component placements for the PCB board, for the circuit board. We do everything from beginning in our own factory in uh, East Army, Finland. That is also very, very special. There are not many actually who do that, if any, nowadays. Uh, same thing is with the whole production, R&D, in different areas, in the software, in embedded software, algorithms, especially if you look at what we have recently have been publishing, for example, in digital signal processing, we have done uh, from day one, we have done everything in, in-house. This is one of the key uh, reasons, and I think it has been very, very critical for leading the technology, for bringing new products, uh, leading the innovation. And I think that's, that's one of the deepest area uh, what Genelec has. Uh, that has required, at the same time, has required to invest a lot in R&D. And that is the reason that if you compare to what is in the industry otherwise, we are a very, very R&D driven company because everything that we do, when you go vertically so deeply, then you have to make sure that you have deep knowledge of what you do and you have people who who are skillful, who have uh, deep knowledge of what what they're looking for. That's right. And a speaker, of course, is a system comprised of different components. And if you're able to do that, you have that oversight of every aspect of the design, which is quite unique, I guess. Exactly, and that is also a very good point because if you look at the way that nowadays you can differentiate from the competition, it's not only about you know doing a single thing here and there, so it's about optimizing the whole system because we are living in a kind of established industry. There is nothing like somebody can come out with a magical thing, magical solution that, okay, this is a breakthrough solution that now we have. There's no many disruptive technology out there because it's, it has been developing for, you know, more than 100 years. If you, if you look at the history of uh, the driver technology and then for at least 50 years, if you look at the uh, loudspeaker speaker technology, especially in the active technology side, so nobody can do right away kind of breakthrough without having very deep and persistent uh, development work and, and research work. Absolutely. And whereas some loudspeaker companies are associated with one particular technology, such as, say, ribbon tweeters or transmission lines, Genelec have actually explored all sorts of different technologies over the years. 
I think that is connected to what we discuss is, uh, you know, the bandwidth that we have is is its own uh, own class because we have been doing uh, R&D work for so long time and we have expanded those core areas to new new technology areas like what I said related to DSP. We are probably one of the, the only companies who have been working in DSP since 95. It's really long time for a company like us to spend so much uh, resource and investment in the in a certain uh, technology just to create something something new. But then when you look at long-term uh, development, then you can see also what is the benefit out there because there are things that you can do. We can, for example, nowadays we can do with DSP technology that nobody else can do that. Not because we are smarter. There, there are a lot of you know, work also outside general. But the question is uh, where to focus. And there are still things like, you know, certain type of driver or limited technology for certain area. But I think uh, we are getting to a situation that more and more this kind of system solution, it matters a lot. There's something else interesting that I've found that not being married to one specific technology or one specific ideal often, often brings me to the point that we're trying to focus on the customer's needs and, and trying to solve that problem with one type of technology is very, very difficult. So when I'm talking about system-wide approaches, we're kind of looking at different types of driver technology, whether we use subwoofers or not, we're trying to expand the solution based on the customer's needs rather than trying to shoehorn a particular technology into every situation. I think that's one area where we're, we are quite unique, where you look through the, through the history, looking at S30 with ribbon tweeters, right up to the present day, looking at the makeup of the ones um, with, with, with a coaxial design that's, that, that is incredibly relevant for, for the way that people are working now. And then you kind of factor in the, the accompanying technologies such as SAM, GLM, the, the kind of the, the ability to optimise for the situation that you're in. All of those complementary technologies are really geared for trying to solve the problems that, that customers are facing day in, day out. And I think that's one of the, the aspects of, yes, we're an R&D-led company, but I think we're a customer-led company first and foremost. And our R&D department are very sensitive to, to the way that people are working. And a lot of those changes in technology have been a, a reaction or having our finger on the pulse, if you like, of, of how people are working. Um, and that leads to different technologies being employed for, for different situations. I'm interested in this question of coaxial drivers because that's a relatively new development for Genelec. What problem does that allow you to address that you couldn't do previously? Well, kind of going back to our 8260 product, which, which featured the, uh, the MDC, the minimum, minimum diffraction coaxial driver, which houses a tweeter and a mid-range driver in the same space, if you like, on the same plane. What we found with that product was that you had an incredibly solid stereo image. Um, the presentation of the tweeter in the mid-range was incredibly consistent, um, and it measured very well. When you put it in a, in a real room, the, the, the response of the tweeter in the mid-range really translated, and it worked incredibly well. Moving on to the ones, that development took a step further where we were able to increase the size of the, the waveguide. So kind of coupling that, that directivity control with the coaxial meant that you had a very consistent stereo image and you could work at, at very close distances. So if you were working in a much smaller room, you were able to have directivity control and a stereo image that was on a par with some of our much larger three-way systems. So there wasn't really a minimum listening distance that you had, had to adhere to. So it meant that you could employ these products in very, very small, tight spaces, but they would also work as, as double duty in much larger spaces as well. So you had a very flexible product that you could place in a number of different environments. It's interesting to hear you mention the waveguide there because that's an aspect of monitor design that's often overlooked. And it's one that Genelec have put an awful lot of research into. Um, can you explain why it's so significant and what makes the Genelec directivity control waveguide so different? It's something that kind of going back to um, the 1000 series in the, in the early 90s, the 1030, 1031, where you started to see a waveguide be introduced. And I believe, see Mark, am I right in saying that the, the waveguide existed even before that? Actually, it was in the beginning of 80s that 
uh, we, we had the first wave guide. That was the beginning of the whole idea. I think the, the concept of wave guide, there are two questions. One is that whether we should have it or not, and uh, that is a choice you know, many manufacturers they make. In general, like it has been always important after you know a couple of products that we had, S30, in S30, we don't have that uh, wave guide with the concept that later we have had, but especially in 80s, those first products that we start developing the wave guide, the whole idea was to how to minimize the negative impact of the room and how to make possible to control the wave, the radiation to the listening point. That was the whole idea and together with then DIP, deep switches, and uh, how to adjust the acoustical side. This has been um, a very essential part of general like, design DNA from, from the beginning. So the whole concept was to minimize the, the room impact to the listening experience. But what makes general like, wave guys so special is, uh, again, I think th this is a kind of tradition that it has uh, essential connection to the fact that how, if you look at in the uh, audio quality, what is critical is to keep the quality consistent from one model to another model that people, they can trust it. And that has been a very special part of the waveguide design that we have been uh, working on from, you know, all products, different model, uh, models across the product uh, series that we, we offer. And then we came to a point that, okay, now we wanted to get closer to the point source. And that was where we started looking at coaxial. We, we actually had a history with the coaxial in the 90s. Uh, and when first time I discussed with Ilbo, when we, we started considering that, I was asking if we have done any, anything related to coaxial before. Uh, he said that we had a prototype from 90s. And when we look at that, there have been a big research work related to how to optimize the coaxial design because coaxial drivers, they have been there for at least 70 years, 80 years. And some companies, they have, they have done a lot of work in, in that area, but applying that to uh, professional monitoring, the quality, the requirements that we had uh, were very tough and we didn't find anything available. So. Uh, we started looking at how we could improve the design of coaxial that could fit to the quality level that we were looking for, getting closer to the point source to uh, eliminate those drawbacks from, for example, having having drivers in in a kind of in different positions. Uh, there, there are certain limitations there that we wanted to to overcome. And then we started uh, working on coaxial with the, with the kind of new approach to integrate that to directivity at the same time that uh, we design a coaxial that there is no any gap between the Twitter and the, the mid range. And that was also a very, very essential step to, to go forward. So also there, we don't, we don't talk about only a, a certain driver technology, but it is combined with the, with the whole acoustical system. Hmm. It's an element when you, when you look at the, the key technologies, when you see the, our key te technologies that we employ in different products and you see them laid out, and it's all of these incremental changes that then add up to the real in-room performance, which is, which is interesting. So kind of not only the waveguide controlling the directivity, but the shape of the cabinet in ensuring that you've that you're kind of reducing the amount of um, hot spots on the corners, if you like, the kind of the minimum diffraction enclosures. So it's all of these kind of incremental improvements that have, that have been added over the years that kind of culminate in this this kind of progression in terms of the way that we can control um, the way that the audio is delivered in the room. And it's something that I think is a core pillar of what we do that we're very mindful of how our products exist and work in the real world. It's all well and good having something that measures fantastically in control conditions, but how can it adapt to the environment that it's, that it's eventually put in? And not only how does it adapt, but how, how do we make it 
straightforward for the customer to get the best out of the system not just kind of leave them hanging if you like say oh sorry your room doesn't quite work so so you're going to have a compromised experience we want to be very realistic about the environments that that these products are going into and we try and try and give people the the means to be able to get back to a, a reference um, I think that's really, really important. It being able to, to establish a reference first and foremost in the, in the design and in the, in the measurement of the, of the loudspeaker, but also to be able to give people the tools to get back to that reference when it's, when it's in the real world. It's interesting to hear you both talk about consistency there and about stability and continuity of design because I think one very common perception in the world at large is that Genelec loudspeakers have what some people would call a family sound. Is that a perception that you encounter a lot and, and how do you interpret it? That is exactly what you, what you said about it. We talk about precision in, in uh, quality of those tools that people they can trust. And it has to be consistent when people they start, you know, looking at different products because anyway, depending on what, what kind of application, what kind of environment they have, they may use different models for their work and they have to be able to trust. And uh, the only way to make that kind of foundation is to make sure that the, that the quality that we offer is consistent. That also plays into the, the need for scalability in our systems, and especially when we're looking at immersive systems that may have to scale. Um, and, and, and having this consistent consistency across different monitors means that we can mix and match to an extent of, of kind of having something larger in, in the front for the LCR to cater for, for a certain listening distance. But then if we're in a position in a room where we're, we're very close to our side speakers or our rears, then we can specify something smaller that will perform in a, in a, in a very, very similar respect to the rest of the system. So it means that if you're a post-production facility, a university, these systems could start out as a 5-1, as a 7-1, but they then can scale. So, it's, so there's, a, there's a level of sustainability in the design of having a family sound that works time and time again, um, that people will start off with a stereo system. They might then expand that to a 5-1 system. And now we're seeing customers expand that out into to Dolby Atmos systems or Aura 3D or other more experimental systems. And we talked a little earlier about the role of digital signal processing in Genelec monitoring, and that has a pretty fundamental role to play in this aspect of things as well, doesn't it? It does. Um, one of my main areas of work is going out to calibrate systems and traditionally going out to, to calibrate a system with, with, with kind of analog tools, with, with, with dip switches, was, was worked very well for stereo systems. Um, but when you started to get up into the larger 5.1, 7.1 and, and now immersive systems, you really need that extra level of precision to be able to time align the system, to be able to have a sense of, of, of consistency from monitor to monitor. So if we're talking about panning through a, an array of seven monitors, having that consistency all the way through that 360 pan is absolutely crucial to be, to be able to buy the sensation of immersion that you're not kind of hearing one speaker that sounds vastly different from, from, from another. So these tools aid that process and speed it up significantly, but they also give us an incredible helping hand in terms of the, the type of rooms that we're finding ourselves in now, the rooms that aren't necessarily kind of designed for audio, they might be repurposed office space with a, with a bit of acoustic treatment. So being able to, to tailor the, um, the response of the monitor in the room and having more of these tools to, to aid that um, it's, it's, it all kind of goes back to the aspect that the, the monitor and the room are an absolute marriage and, and you need them to, to work together to an extent. And I think it has been, it is a kind of evolution in the, in the technology that I, I think uh, as, a, as a company our job is to uh, bring the technology closer to users, what is possible to do with technology and then there are customers or users who then choose that what is what's the benefit of having that. And I think it has been one of the key advantage that we have had uh, from the beginning. It has been so that the interaction that we have had uh, with demanding customers, users, and I think that has been a very essential part of why we are, we are here. And uh, if you look at uh, from that side, then basically 
we have been following, we have been looking at the DSP as a kind of complementary thing, which is actually a kind of continuation of what we have been doing. So uh, our focus is to create a design that can reproduce the sound as neutral as possible and then stay consistent in that. And uh, with DSP, we take, you know, another step forward. So we are not we are not compensating anything related to the basic design, the electroacoustical mechanical design, but we we continue from there. So it's is not about uh, doing anything, or making compromises in the in the design foundation, and then use DSP to manipulate that. But it's yet another tool to go forward, and that's the reason that if you, if you look at the DSP. What we do with DSP, its focus in is in what Andy explained that we use that to minimize the negative impact of the room, and that is also connected to you know the core philosophy of the company, as we have had deep switches from the first product from you know S30. So so it's about the target is same, but we use we benefit from new technology and and the development that has been happening in that area so it's not so much about correcting anomalies in the loudspeaker as about integrating the loudspeaker into its environment yes exactly exactly headphone listening has become a major growth area in both consumer music consumption and in studio monitoring have you thought about moving into that market well, I think that's that's interesting question. Is is also if you look at the, what has been happening in terms of audio production, especially in the professional side, and what we have seen also recently, uh, the impact of COVID nineteen that it has you know it has been accelerating the whole development that uh, more and more people who use headphones or, or small setup at their home and uh, and so on uh, is very interesting question we have not been uh, doing that we have not been having headphone product but is basically because of you know principally there is a there's a big question to to deal with that and the question is the experience that you get from the headphone it has been always so that the you, you start feeling that, uh, you know, you don't have uh, this kind of stereo image, you, you don't have uh, localization uh, as accurate that you, you should have in what you do when you are, when you are working on audio monitoring. Uh, we have been working on the headphone side, but not in the physical headphone. We, we published Aural ID, which is basically a service for uh, HRTF to actually improve the uh, listening quality or listening quality of audio and headphone when you use headphone as a tool. And that is connected to localization that you start feeling that uh, you are listening to uh, at least the audio is externalized. And that is the first thing to, to deal with when you when you start using headphone as a as a kind of audio monitoring tool, so we have been active in that area. Actually, we are we have been in the front line of that that area, but we have not been manufacturing headphone. I think this is an interesting area because for those of our listeners who haven't uh, seen it, Oral ID, the basic idea of Oral ID is that you take a video of your ear and upload it to a server, and then. HRTF or head related transfer function is calculated and then you can download that and load it up into your monitoring software and it will adapt the sound that's coming out of your headphones for your personal hearing system. Can you explain a little bit more about the benefits of that? Well, the basic benefit is to be able to trust that you localize the sound in the right ways. If you if you look at as I said the main drawback or headphone is that you feel that the sound is coming from inside your head and that is not as such is not uh, suitable for uh, professional work that you do in some phases they people they use that but not in phases where they start replacing for example monitoring loudspeakers by having headphone if they don't have to do that 
But that is the first thing that we can do. But the ultimate question is how to come up with a solution that could actually uh, create the same kind of experience that people they, they could have at the time that they're working with the monitoring setup. And mimicking that is not an easy task. But anyway, oral ID, it gives one step toward that direction. And because there are also, if you, if you look at what are those factors that have impacts to the listening experience that people they have, a lot of speaker is the starting point, but the, the space, the room, where you live, when you play the lot of speaker, that has a big impact to, to what kind of experience people they have and what kind of judgment, what kind of decision they make in their work. But uh, what we have been now focusing on is to, to actually make possible to do that uh, with headphones in the future. We are not there, we are far away from there, but the technology that currently we offer is one big step toward that direction and that could be actually used for whatever headphone that people they have out there there, there are so many headphones and I, I think that's that's probably one of the most interesting areas for if you look at some years from now that would be very very interesting area and is uh, is also connected to the immersive because i i think immersive is one a uh, very, very important trend in audio industry and is going to be very important in the near future. And question is how immersive could be produced, could be consumed. And uh, there are many companies who have been starting looking at uh, the area that we are talking about, uh, our, our ID and HRTF area. And I, uh, I think everybody has realized that how important is going to be in the future. That's an interesting example of how far-reaching and wide-ranging the research is that goes on at Genelec. Um, I'm just wondering, are you able to give us any insight into what other topics your a current focus of research at the company? Well, it is uh, very interesting to see that uh, if you look at the development in the technology, not only in the audio, because you know the, the, when you look at different technology development path is always there, there are certain things that they come from your own industry, own community, but there are also areas that they come from outside your, your industry. I, I think DSP, digital signal processing, is one of those areas that uh, you know, is not limited to, to audio industry. It is uh, actually is the significant development has been happening outside that, but it, it has been utilized and applied then to uh, to the audio technology audio industry and i think that's going to to continue that's uh, whatever we will see in the future at least for next uh, five to ten years i think is essentially it will be connected to dsp and and digital technology anyway and that is what we have been also doing a lot of work and we will continue work on that area fascinating I have one last question, which is we don't often talk about sustainability in relation to studio equipment, but it is becoming an increasingly important consideration. And it's one that's actually quite high up Genelec's agenda. Can you give us some examples of how you're ensuring that your business is as green as possible? I have a wonderful question. Thank you very much. I think it's, uh, uh, this is a question that is relevant to everyone whether we are in the manufacturer side or, or the user side, as a human being, I think that's that's one of the biggest issues that we are uh, we are going to have. Uh, first, I would like to emphasize that there is no manufacturer who can claim that whatever they do is uh, in line with the sustainability or, or uh, because I think that uh, whatever you do, there is there's a footprint for that. So the question is how to minimize the negative impact of uh, what you do to the nature. And I think Genelec has a very, very long and very deep tradition in that uh, because, uh, again, from the beginning, what customers they were asking, their requirements were tough. Like things like uh, making products that are reliable and they last for a long time. I think that was a 
brilliant demand from our customers. And we are very thankful for that. So we have realized that from the beginning. Then we come to certain areas that in terms of operation, what you could do to minimize the footprint of your operation. Also, what kind of material you use. And that is then connected to one very essential part of what we have been doing, uh, using recycled aluminum. I think that's, that's a big thing. And I think the whole heritage is so much connected to the founders of the companies and the the values they, they have had that it has been, you know, it has been looked at as a very natural part of what they do. And, and of course, we are very happy that uh, it has become more and more relevant. And uh, uh, we just have to continue. I think we, we have a lot to do in, in that area. And... Uh, not only us, but everyone else as well. But uh, we have a very, very good starting point. And that's also connected to why we do so much in-house, because we have a very, very good visibility. We have, uh, we have competencies, we have skills, we have deep knowledge on what kind of choices we can make from the components up to, up to the end product. There, there are also certain areas that uh, we, we have been looking at in, in addition to the type of material, the recycled mat aluminum that we have been using, about 10 years ago, we also published this composite uh, enclosure. Uh, that was also very, very interesting, uh, interesting thing that, that we, we did. The very delightful uh, sign that we have been witnessing during the last few years is, is that more and more people, they are aware of that. They are getting, you know, it becomes important for, for them when they make their choices. And I think because of, exactly because of that, we have uh, every manufacturer, including us, we have a very big responsibility to communicate that. When you, when you ask about, you know, the future development, I would say that sustainability definitely will be uh, one area that we will keep developing. Uh, whatever we can do. But it, uh, it required also a very sophisticated production line. We raise the temperature during the production up to 170 and then suddenly coming down to make the finishing with, without any painting. So that was, a, that was actually very, very fascinating work. But it was very sad to, to see the reaction from, from some people in the professional audio that they were saying that sustainability is not a big thing for professional audio. But it is, at the same time, it is fascinating how how quickly it has changed. You know, 10 years is not a long time. And now you can see more and more, even in, in production facilities that they're talking about, even the, mm. in some studios that they're, they're talking about. In BBC a few years ago, they did a big research related to this subject. And I'm 100% I'm sure that there are more and more people there who are realizing that, who are coming to, to that area. And that is, that's a very good thing for us, of course. Yes, and of course, if you look back now at the studio equipment of the 50s and 60s and 70s, a lot of that is still usable today, whereas the equipment that was made only 10 years ago is now unusable and unrepairable. Exactly, and actually that is, that is also very interesting because, as, as you said, in the, in the music industry, if you look at those uh, you know, instruments, some of those instruments, they're very, very old, but they're much more expensive. Like, I, I play saxophone, and I have product that is from you know, 35 years ago, 35 years ago, and you know, I, I enjoy from that. I don't want to have a new one. Mm. Is uh, actually it has even more value. That's very popular in the instrument side, and I think that's a very nice heritage to to also benefit from when we talk about sustainability. Because I, I think we are in a cycle in our society that few years ago, you know, we discuss a lot that whenever you go to the show, you have to show something new. It, it becomes actually artificial that, you know, they put, uh, you know, new, new, new. But when you look at that uh, in more deeper level, then you don't see anything new. And there's a kind of illusion of uh, newness. And, and that's something I think is part of the behavior that we have learned. And we have to somehow unlearn that. 
Another aspect of this is what people are calling the right to repair. Exactly, exactly. That is one area that we have been looking a, a lot, and that is advantage that we have. That I have said that I don't want to see that day that there is a there is a generic product that the person wants to repair, and we say that we cannot. And even you know S thirties, we have still we we have been offering services for that product is oh, not wow. is not part of the package that we offer. But anyway, we don't leave that either. And uh, I think that is one of the most important area, an interesting area to to deal with in the future. That how far we can go uh, in terms of offering a spare part, the services. And uh, I would say that the ideal situation would be that. This is my dream, that uh, we get to a point that we can promise or we can take the responsibility that whatever products go out from our factory, at some point, decades after that, that they have been used and used, if there is no other way to deal with, then we can take back. I think creating this kind of closed loop would be one of the most interesting things in terms of sustainability in the future. Clearly, this is something that you at Genelec have thought about very deeply. Yeah, I think is uh, if you look at different areas that you want to develop, I think whatever you do, it is somehow is connected to sustainability. I think also business-wise, it makes sense. And that was the reason that in 2008, okay, we have been doing things for a long time from the beginning, but 2008, we raised that as a part of, you know, the, the company strategy that sustainability is as important as profitability and sound quality. And I think that's a very, very, very nice way of, you know, saying that. Well, it sounds as though Genelec are going to keep developing in all sorts of areas and continuing to grow. And um, thank you for that fascinating conversation. It's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you both. Um, thank you very much for your time. Uh, C. McNagyan and Andy Bensley, thank you. Thank you very much, Sam. Thank you very much for excellent questions that you had. And I'm, I'm really happy that you have so good insight to the subject. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sam. Thanks for having us. It's a pleasure. Thank you for listening. And be sure to check out the show notes page for this episode, where you'll find further information along with web links and details of all the other episodes. And just before you go, let me point you to the soundonsound.com forward slash podcast website page, where you can explore what's playing on our other channels. <laughs>